Last time you will recall, or if you were here, you will recall that we uh, began something and it got long enough at that point that I decided to make it into two parts so as not to keep you through the whole thing. So uh, today you'll find out how much more we had to go. <laughs> so I want to do I want a brief review, brief review, and then we'll move on into, uh, into it. But uh, back in Genesis 2, back in Genesis 2, uh, we see uh, what God says here to Adam. Says, uh, the, he says, uh, <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 15, says, The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, <clears throat> You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now notice a couple of things there. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did Adam drop dead that day when he ate it? Well, did God tell him the truth? What do you have there? What, what, what is the meaning of this? And you know, the, you can look at the commentaries and the different uh, opinions about this. You will find a, a multitude of them. I think the three main ones are as follows. Number one, uh, it just means simply that Adam experienced spiritual death. And yet, and I'm not going to turn there, but in, I'll just refer you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23 and the surrounding verses. It is very clear that the Apostle Paul links the death described here with the death he's talking about there. And it is a death that is only cured by a resurrection. So, no, this is not talking about a mere spiritual death, whatever that's supposed to mean. Now, the reason I brought, bring that up is because some, uh, especially among Reformed, as well as other groups, will look at this and say, well, he, he died spiritually. That means he has to be resurrected spiritually before he, he can even choose to obey Christ or to, to receive Christ as a Savior. <clears throat> the idea of total depravity, uh, meaning total inability. A human being is born totally unable to even accept the, the uh, you know, legitimately accept the offer to salvation unless, unless he's been uh, vivified by the Spirit. But I, I don't find that anywhere in Scripture. That's not what he's talking about here. This, he's talking about a very real death, obviously, uh, as we understand death. The second view is that God in his mercy changed his mind and allowed Adam to live. And that, that would kind of make sense because you see what he does uh, with King Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20. We won't turn there, but uh, in that case, he had told Hezekiah uh, when he was going to die. And Hezekiah prayed, and then the prophet, he, God had the prophet turn around, come back, said, God has changed his mind. He will extend your life by 15 more years. So some, have, some believe that Adam, or God in his mercy, extended Adam's life. A lot more than 15 years, though. Uh, that's that's a, an option. That's, that's one of the interpretations that's out there. And some say, well, it's just a way of saying you will become mortal. So the idea here is that Adam was created an immortal being, and then once he ate the forbidden fruit, once he disobeyed God, in other words, <coughs> he became mortal. But there are problems with that as well. Uh, and that, that takes me to the view that I believe is the most plausible. And it is as follows. This is simply proleptic. You know what prolepsis means. In other words, you, know, you find a lot of it in Scripture. You find where God is speaking to someone about the future, and yet he is using terms that would lead you to think that he's talking about the present. For example, he tells Abraham, I have, when he takes him into the land, Abraham has not inherited the land yet. Understand that. In fact, to this day, he has not inherited the land. And uh, he says that he, in the Hebrews chapter 11, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in tents in the land of promise, but they never received the promises. So Abraham, God tells Abraham, nevertheless, I have given you this land. Walk up and down in it. I have given it to you as a possession, and yet he didn't possess it. He had to buy a place to, in the land to bury his wife. And also, in, uh, when he's just talking with uh, concerning Sarah and her 
the fact that she's going to give birth and that uh, the heir, Abraham's heir, will, will come from her. Uh, he says something to the effect of nations have come from you. If you look at it in the Hebrew, nations have come from you. Uh, not yet, but still, you understand, this is prolepsis. And so when God says, in the day you eat of it, then you shall surely die. He didn't mean that he would fall dead that day. This is proleptic. In other words, this is sure to happen. And it was sure to happen. Adam did die. And his progeny ever since have been dying. And why is that? Not because they were made mortal, that they were at one time immortal, but because they were cut off from the tree of life. So there was no innate immortality in Adam. He would have been mortal anyway had it not been for access to the tree of life. And once he lost access to the tree of life, well then now, guess what? He's going to die. Because he can't have, he can't have the fruit, however symbolic that is, it, it's not important for the sake of our discussion, but he cannot have the fruit that would impart to him immortality, or that is to say, keep him living, keep him living on and on. But there was no innate inherent immortality in him even from the very day of his creation. So I think that is definitely the better the better interpretation and it does not it really doesn't say anything about this concept of dying spiritually and becoming totally unable to respond to God. Now last time we looked at some examples and we saw that indeed after the what is called the fall of man that some of Adam's descendants did continue to worship God. They entered into covenant relationship with him. And then over time, though, as they uh, mixed and mingled with those who were not worshipers of God, it seems that the non, the, those who didn't worship God had a greater influence on them than they did on them until it came to the point where God was so displeased with man that he flooded the world. Now, in Genesis chapter 6, I'm just going to refer to this without turning over there, but it says the Lord was sorry, said God was sorry that he had put man on the earth. The implication there is that there's a great disappointment, that it could have gone in a different way, but now it didn't. If God had known all along, if he'd known from eternity, as classical theism would tell us, he'd known from all eternity that this event would happen, it makes no sense to say that he was at this point sorry that he had put man upon this earth. Furthermore, it says that flesh had corrupted itself. It doesn't mean, as some claim, that it was already corrupted from the fall of Adam onward. No, no, there were those who were worshiping God, but now then it seems that corruption had become universal. So it's not a matter of inherent original sin that led to this. It was just the fact that they had free choices along the way, and they continued to make the wrong choices until it led them to this, uh, this point where God had to bring judgment upon the world. A very severe judgment it was. Now, it has often been said that the Apostle Paul gives us the authoritative interpretation of these passages uh, from the book of Genesis. And I agree, I agree, but I do not agree with the way Paul's statements are often interpreted. So that's what we want to look at today. I want to go over and now we're continuing. That's the summary, continuing in uh, part two in Romans chapter one. I turn here because I want to give you a little bit of background of what will follow in uh, the chapters two and three. In Romans chapter 1, I want to look at uh, just the one verse here, verse 13. It says, uh, I want you to know, brothers, that I often in intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Notice this, as he's talking to the church here, the church in Rome. And he says, he refers to the rest of the Gentiles. What is the implication here? The implication is that this church is predominantly Gentile at this point. 
Now remember, and I'm not going to turn there, I will again refer you to Acts chapter 2 and verse 5 and surrounding verses. This was on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and we're told that there were Jews from all nations. And it names a lot of them. And it names Rome, Jews and proselytes. So this was, uh, this was expected because this was one of the pilgrimage festivals. The day of Pentecost uh, was one of the pilgrimage festivals. So Jews from all over the, all over the known world, uh, east and west, including Rome and all over Asia Minor and so on, they were there dwelling in Jerusalem. And so the early church began when the Holy Spirit came, when those 3,000 were baptized on the first day and many more afterward. At first, it was entirely Jewish. And when I say Jewish, that includes proselytes. That's Gentiles who had become Jews. They had already embraced uh, Judaism, if you want to call it that. But in any case, this is who, this is who was there. But, uh, and then obviously, over time, these people from Rome and elsewhere, uh, they stayed there quite a while, but they went back to their own homes eventually. And, and no doubt they formed communities there, or churches. They began to meet in, in usually in house, what we would call house churches, but they met like that. And they, so the church in those areas began to grow. Now, over time then, once the Gentile mission had come, once Paul's ministry had begun, then Gentiles began, began coming into the church in far greater numbers. So this verse here at Romans 1 indicates to us uh, the situation inside the church, or actually churches, several house churches, in the city of Rome. We think of the church of Rome, we think of some massive cathedral. But no, it wasn't like that in those days. They met together in somebody's house. They might have been independent synagogues, but they usually had uh, several different uh, meeting places. And you had combined services, or, or, or if you want to call them mixed services with Jews and Gentiles. Now, as you can imagine, because of the cultural differences, this could lead to some cultural shock. And that's what was going on. In fact, you had uh, one group thinking it was a little bit better than the other group because it had certain advantages the other group didn't have. And the other group, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, was saying, no, 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 you know, we're outnumbering you now. God has favored us over you. We're the rest of your people. And so that's, the, that's what you have going on is this, this dichotomy and a little bit of tension there. And unfortunately, you have a whole lot of misinformation on both sides. So this is the context. I think it's important we put that in its context before we proceed. But now let's go on to uh, Romans 2, Romans 2, with that context in mind, and look at verse 12. We'll see, we'll see how this is playing out. Beginning in verse 12, it says, For all who have sinned, without the law, will also perish without the law. Now wh who is he talking about here? those who sin without the law. Remember the, what the Church of Rome was made up of two groups primarily, the Jews and the Gentiles. Those who have sinned without the law, that would be the Gentiles. These are people who grew up and were not exposed to the Torah. Uh, those who, of course, we know many Gentiles did go to hear the reading of the law and the prophets and the synagogues. But so many of these who had come into the church by this point grew up, never had the advantage of hearing the Torah read every Sabbath. They were Gentiles. They probably had come out of idolatry, in fact. But he says, all those who have sinned without the law, that's Gentiles, will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law, that would be the Jews, will be judged by the law. And he goes on to explain how this works. He says in verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And he's not saying uh, law keeping will is the cause of your justification, but this is the characteristic of those justified. They will be obedient to the law. You say, well, okay, well, how, what about those who are without the law, the Gentiles? Uh, how are they judged? He goes on to say, for, then, for when Gentiles, and he's talking about pre-conversion, some people make the mistake of saying because of the language that's used in this passage, they make the mistake of thinking that he's referring to Gentiles who are in the church. 
Because it sounds like he's saying Gentiles who already have the Holy Spirit, but that's not what he's saying. That violates, that concept violates what is being said here. It says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. By nature, do you get that? Do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Even though they do not have the advantage of having the Torah to hear read to them or to read it for themselves. They don't have that advantage. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they, when they do by nature what is in the law, then they become a law to themselves. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when according to my gospel, gospel God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. What he's saying here is that even though Gentiles do not have the written law, do not have the Torah, they are still accountable before God, not because of Adam's sin, but because they have a certain witness as to the righteousness of God. What is it? We call it the natural law. That's what the theologians refer to it as natural law. And there are many, many uh, modern day examples of that. Uh, whole books have been written about it. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, has a good section on it. Uh, the law of nature and uh, also we know that you, some of you may remember many years ago in a magazine that was published temporarily by uh, connected with the church at that time was called uh, Quest magazine well, there's an article in there a very very interesting article on the pygmies and how when the pygmies were found a tribe of pygmies in Africa were discovered they were basically they were observing what we would call most of the Ten Commandments. Now, how is that? Oh, oh, did they have Bibles? No, no, didn't know anything about that. Had the missionaries already gotten to them? Nope, never heard of it. It was natural law. They understood by nature. These are things you can arrive at. If you look at the Ten Commandments, most everything that's in there, you can arrive at uh, by, by reason. And human beings have this written on their nature. I mean, how many, how many peoples on the face of the earth think, well, I wonder if it's all right if I go out here and kill my neighbor. I better look that up in the Bible. <laughs> no, no, that's something you naturally discern, something you understand. And everybody, anybody who can look at nature itself, look around and see the incredible design. This is why people all over the world believe in a God. Even those who believe in multiple gods, usually you find that they believe in a higher God behind it all. The Creator. And uh, so they, we see intelligent design in the world that leads us to belief in the Creator. And you can come to the conclusion by way of natural reason that he alone deserves our worship and is to be worshiped that it, it doesn't take a lot of thinking to come to that conclusion does it that obviously we owe our worship to the one who made us our allegiance our loyalty is to him so that can come be, be arrived at by reason. That's what he's talking about here. And you look at the other commandments of the law and you find, sure enough, in many primitive tribes around the world that they have many of those things in place and they arrive there by nature. Now, that's not to say that that's just as good as revealed law. No, actually you need revealed law in order to, to guide what you already have in nature. In order to, uh, in other words, you, you need an objective moral standard uh, to go by because nature does become corrupted when it's exposed when it's exposed to uh, evil influences then it becomes corrupted over time and you begin to lose sight of what God put into the human mind uh, to understand by nature so this is what's uh, what uh, is going on here and, and but Paul's point is not to emphasize the importance of having that that objective moral standard in written form. His point is, his point is that it doesn't matter if you are Gentiles, you still are accountable before God. There is still a witness as to God's righteousness. And therefore, when you break God's law, 
then you are accountable or held accountable. It says, uh, let's go let's read a little further here. Um, continuing in verse 17, now he turns to the other group. He says, but if you call yourselves a Jew or yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. Now he's not saying this is a bad thing. You need to abandon that. Not at all. No, no. Paul agrees that it is a good thing. It is instructive. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, he's not saying that's not in the law, he's agreeing that it is in the law. You then who teach others, and here's the point, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? It seems here that the Apostle Paul has in mind particular individuals. He seems to know some of the congregants here, some of the people, members of this congregation. And he knows that some who are teaching the law and presenting themselves as a light to the blind and so on, that they themselves are hypocritical and are not observing the law, uh, the, the precepts of the law. He says, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. Now he's not saying that everyone who teaches the law is in this category. He's just asking the question. He's saying, are those of you who are teaching, the, you who call yourselves Jews, you, of the, you who were circumcised on the eighth day of your life, who grew, grew up hearing the reading of the law in the synagogue, and now you're going to teach the Gentiles all about God's law, are you yourself guilty of breaking what you're teaching, the very commandments you're teaching them? And he says, for it is written, and he's quoting from Isaiah 52, verse 5, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So when Gentiles see the witness of the Jews and they know that the Jews are the people who are called by God's own name, being in covenant relationship with him and that they have this excellent law and yet they themselves are not living by it. What are the Gentiles? What do they do? They look at them and they realize they're dragging the name of their God through the mud. Who would turn to that God when it, these, are, these are his people? So the name of God is blasphemed because of you. So he applies that text to some of these people. And then he goes on to say, for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. Now one point, this is a side note, not my main point, but there are those who say there's no such thing or no distinction in scripture between the moral law and a ceremonial law or a civil law, that those are man-made distinctions. I've heard that from Hebrew roots people I've also heard it from the people who hold New Covenant theology, which states that the Old Testament law has been abolished and replaced by this new law, the law of Christ, which is described in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, you've, you've heard all of that. <clears throat> so you have these two extremes. And I have seen material from both these extremes say, essentially, the law is the law is the law. There, is no distinct, there are no distinctions. The law doesn't spell out any distinctions of moral versus ceremonial versus civil, etc. And you, you possibly could break it down further. But uh, the truth is, if you look at what he's saying right here, it becomes evident. Even though the law, nowhere in Scripture does it specifically say that there is a ceremonial law and that there is a moral law. Nevertheless, you realize there is because of Scriptures just like this one. Because it says... Circumcision indeed is of value. Talking about physical circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. You mean there's a difference between circumcision and the law he has in mind here? Yeah, yeah, there is. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, you mean, wait a minute, isn't circumcision part of the law? If he's not circumcised, then he's not keeping the precepts of the law. That's the way the argument would go. 
But here Paul makes a distinction, doesn't he? He sees a distinction of categories within the law itself. So if a man is, who is uncircumcised, meaning physically, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and are circumcised physically but break the law. You see, you, you get what he's meaning here. You get his meaning here. There clearly are distinctions. That's not, the, that's not uh, like I say, that's a, a side note. It's not really the main thrust of the message today. But, uh, <clears throat> but there, it's a fact that there are distinctions like that within the law, even though it's not, they don't have a heading that says moral versus ceremonial versus ci civil, etc. But you, get, you see his meaning here. It says, for no one is a Jew... For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. So just because you have all the physical characteristics and look like one of them, doesn't mean you are one of them, truly, in the heart. Nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from men, but from God. So his point here in all of this is to show the Jews that there's no room for boasting. You don't have any room for boasting. Uh, because you have Gentiles who are, observe, who are keeping the righteousness of the law, though they're uncircumcised. And you have you, some of you who are, though you're circumcised, you are not keeping the precepts of the law. You, you see what he's saying here. And, and at the end of the day, if you look, and we'll also go back to uh, earlier to chapter 1. I want us to see that he is saying it doesn't matter who you are, whether Jew or Gentile. You're all in this same category. So the point is stop treating each other this way. Okay, stop approaching things from this, this perspective. And back in chapter 1, he spells that out pretty clearly. And I, I'd, mentioned, I'd mentioned before that many say that Paul gives the authoritative interpretation of Genesis. And I agree with that, but I don't agree with the way he is, Paul himself is often interpreted. So let's go back to chapter 1 now. Put it, now that we have a, a broader context to understand who the people were, back in chapter 1, and let's uh, take up the account there beginning in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And understand that. If you, if, you don't, if you suppress the truth, then what does that mean you have? Can you suppress something you don't have to begin with? <clears throat> well, read on. He, he answers the question. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Who's he talking about? <coughs> not the Jews in particular. It goes on to say, because God has shown it to them. Notice that God has shown it to them. Now we've already seen how God shows things to people. He shows, th he, he shows, he reveals himself and his will through the written word, but he also reveals it in nature. That's, that's important because uh, we, we, what we did, we read Paul's conclusions before we read these statements so we can see what he's talking about here. This is what he has in mind. And he doesn't go back just a, a few, back just to his own era. He's not talking about just his own time and what he's familiar with. But he takes this all the way back to the creation. Notice what he says. It says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, what is, when you have the word so, the statement that follows then is connected very closely with the preceding statement, isn't it? In other words, because ever since the creation of the world, God's will has been perceived, the things of God have been perceived, so therefore, they are without excuse. In other words, they have known the truth. Or at least the light of truth that they have was sufficient that when they violated it, then they were left without excuse. 
They're not, in other words, you, you cannot, if you, were in, if you were truly in total ignorance, then you would have not have the same level of accountability if, uh, for those who are not in total ignorance. And obviously these people he has in mind going back to creation were not in ignorance. Now when you examine the account, that's why last time we went through the story of Adam and his descendants, the Sethites uh, and the other, the descendants of Cain, and, and the two lines that came forth from them and then the problem that eventually emerged. So going back then, there were people even back then, of course the pattern has repeated since the flood, but going back then you see this same pattern. They knew God, but they did not retain knowledge of God in their minds, but they, they turned to other things and so they are left without excuse. It says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they be became, important word, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. There's something they didn't have to do. In other words, there were choices involved here. There's not something that they were by nature programmed to do and that they would inevitably always for sure do it and it was in God's program from the very beginning. If that were the case, why would God say he was sorry that he had made man? If it was something that he put in place from eternity, had always known would happen because that's part of the divine decree that it would happen. And when it does happen, when men do make these wrong decisions, why is all of a sudden God sorry? Well, why does he bring judgment on something that he had decreed beforehand would happen? It seems to me that God is accountable in all that rather than the, than the people that he holds accountable. Of course, Calvinists would get all terribly upset, bent out of shape to hear a statement like that made, but that, there's no other conclusion I can come to. Goes on to say, claiming to be wise, they became, important word, became fools, and exchanged, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, I've gone through this before. What you have here is a reversal of the creation order. In the creation order, what you find is God giving man dominion over all the creatures of the earth and the sea and the birds of the air and so forth. Here you see now he's bowing down before images of all these things. There we're told that he made them male and female and told them to be fruitful and multiply. That's the, that's the divinely established order of creation. Male and female. That's how he made them. And uh, here you see, well just read on there, it says, Therefore God gave them up because they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So therefore God gave them up, meaning God abandoned them because they abandoned him. It's not that God just decided beforehand that I'm, th at this point I'm going to abandon them for no reason at all except by my will. No, no, he abandons them because he abandons uh, him. They abandon him. So he gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So they once had the truth and they're accountable for it, but now they have exchanged it through their own choice and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed of God forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to, he let them have their way, turned them over to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed in passion for one another. And it, it goes on, but the point here is you have a reversal of the creation order and all of this involved choices made by people and not because they were unable to make any other choice, but because they, they, they became this way over time, not, not that they were born in this condition. You know, I heard uh, Vody Balkum, have you, have you, have you familiar with Vody Balkum? He's a powerful pre preacher. He's, a, he's reformed, meaning he's a Calvinist. Uh, I love to hear him. A lot of good stuff. He preaches on subjects like this, and he's very passionate. But when he gets into his Calvinism, uh, you know, 
At that point, I have to turn him out and turn him off. But he makes some interesting statements. He said uh, he was talking about total depravity and the state into which we're born. And he, he did this partly for humor's sake, but nevertheless, the, what he conceives or perceives to be truth was behind it. And he said, uh, you know how we look at a little baby. We see a little baby in the crib or see somebody having a, just what looks like a sweet little innocent baby. He said, oh, what a precious little angel. He said, no, 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 that's not a precious little angel. That's a viper in a diaper. <laughs> and the, the idea is that we're born bearing Adam's nature, a fallen nature, and inevitably we will behave accordingly as we grow up. Well, I say it's not so inevitable. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree that we're all corrupted in some measure by the world we live in. Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, we still are accountable. We're still accountable. And little babies are not vipers and diapers. Uh, they're, they're actually uh, little innocent babies. They are innocent. They're not born bearing Adam's guilt. You know, that's, that's one that just, I don't see anybody can actually take that seriously. You think about it. Here, Adam, as the federal head of mankind, falls into sin, and that sin, not, not other subsequent sins that he may have committed, but that sin then uh, is, is the original sin. And original sin is really, is, well, it's not, not that sin, but original sin is what is then passed on to all of his children, all the way down through the millennium. And so we're all born bearing Adam's guilt. I don't mean feelings of guilty, I'm saying being actually, mean actually guilty. And the way Augustine put it was that the whole human race is one, one condemned, from God's perspective, is one condemned clump. Or like a big clump of clay. And it's all condemned. And he looks across history and he decides that he'll carve out a little bit of this clump from here to there to the other. By his will, not by anything he sees in the condemned clump. And uh, because, because of, he's just gracious in that way and kind and merciful, uh, he elects or selects certain ones, certain individuals, by carving them out of the clump, as it were, and then uh, preserving them for salvation. When he could do the whole lump, but no, no, no. No, he's just going to do those that he selects uh, for his own glory. But anyway, that that's, moves beyond uh, where I wanted to go with this today. So that's, that's the idea there. But uh, I say that this text throughout, you see how they exchange, how they became, and so on. You see, it's a process. It begins when sin enters the picture, and you allow it to fester. You allow it to grow and continue to grow. And you, the influences that introduced it to you, you allow them to continue to be influences in your lives. And that's, that's why, that's why this, this subject is so important, is because you look at the world we're living in today. Look at the world we're living in today. Do you think there are any evil influences out there? Do you think the minds of children today are being conditioned? Or shall we say groomed? I think they are. I think, I think people, I know they are. Because all of us are in some measure products of our own cultures, of our own upbringings, of our experiences in life, of the people we associate with, and of what, of what culture tells us is right and wrong rather than what God tells us is right and wrong. You know, that goes back to the original sin right there, doesn't it? The original sin was really, in effect, it was man deciding for himself what right and wrong was going to be. After God had said, don't, don't eat from this, the, the fruit of this tree. Don't eat it. In the day you eat of it, you will die. And he does it anyway. What is that? What is that? That's him deciding, the man deciding for himself what is right and what is wrong over against what God has told him. And that's what we see in the world today. It's the same pattern. <clears throat> and the point is, we are susceptible if we're not careful. So he goes on, and uh, let me just read uh, verse 28. Uh, and since they did, uh, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God, again, gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Now those things, those sins, particular things mentioned back in the previous verses are not the only things mentioned here. 
Notice what else comes about as a result of abandoning God. And then he gives us up to the things that we choose. He says, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It seems, I, I think I see a lot of that in the world today. Because I do believe that somewhere in there, in their darkened minds with a lot of people, I'm not talking about everybody, but a lot of darkened minds, what appear to be darkened minds to me, somewhere in there, there is that natural law, and somewhere in there, they know better. They know better than what they're doing. And not only do they do these things, but they advocate them. Now with all that, that we're skipping around in Romans, with all that in mind, let's go to Romans, the third chapter. Because, because here Paul is going to use some, some texts. And these texts are often said to be, say, well, this, this is the authoritative interpretation of those texts, and we have to accept Paul's interpretation of them. And even though I agree with that in some measure, nevertheless, I think Paul is misunderstood at times by some people. But let's go to chapter 3 and we'll begin in verse 9. It says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? So again, that's the controversy. Are the Jews better off than the Gentiles? I mean, after all, we have the law, they don't. Or they didn't. You know, they didn't grow up with what we grew up with. So are we any better off? He says, no, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now, again, when he, I want to ask you the question, what do you think he means when he says all men in this context, the context we've looked at today? When he speaks of all or all men, is he talking about every single human being, including that little viper in the diaper or that little sweet little angel that's in the, you know, the, the arms of the mother back there, wherever they may be, uh, including them? Is that what he means when he says all? Remember the context. All here means both Jews and Gentiles. You got that? All means not one or the other, but both groups. Okay? He says, again, what then? Are we Jews any better off? And his answer is no. No, we're not. Not at all. For as we have already charged that all, both all, there's the all, both Jews and Greeks, that's the definition, are under sin. And why is that? Because they break the law knowingly. They break God's standards knowingly. That's why. Whether, regardless how the standards came to them, whether by nat natural law or whether by revealed law. As it is written, and now he's going to quote from Psalm 14. I'll turn back there in a few moments and see what it actually says. And, but Paul is saying here, none is righteous. He quotes Psalm 14. None is righteous, no, not one. Does that mean we were all, each one of us was a viper in a diaper at one time? Not what it means. Let's, read, let's go and read it. But I understand how people can come to that conclusion. None, and none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands no one seeks for God. You know, I was reading a book by R.C. Sproul, who was a Calvinist, deceased now, but uh, he was quoting this and saying, he hears Christians all the time talking about people are seeking God, and he says, no, they are not. People who are not elect are not seeking God. If you're unelected, if you're not one of those fortunate enough to have been chosen from the foundation of the world, then you do not seek God, because this text right here says so. And yet, and yet, I won't turn there, but when I look at Acts chapter 17, I think I will turn to this one. Just hold your place here. Let's go back to Acts, the book of Acts chapter 17. Here the Apostle Paul is addressing the men of the Areopagus, the philosophers on Mars Hill. And he's very well familiar with their own literature, their own concepts and ideas. He even quotes from a couple of their, the poets they were familiar with. 
But here in this, uh, in this context, he says, and uh, we'll start in verse 26, and he made from one man, this is Paul talking, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. You can understand that to mean Adam, which no doubt is what he has in mind, but also Noah. You could take that to mean Noah, because everybody came from Noah as well. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So in other words, when they, man spread out over the earth after the Tower of Babel, then God, it says, he determined the boundaries of their dwellings. You see what was going on at the Tower of Babel. It had come to the place that they were one language, one people, and God said nothing would be impossible to them. He's not saying that they will achieve great technological advancements ahead of time. That's not what he's talking about. When he says nothing will be impossible to them, it's not a favorable thing. It's not a positive thing. It's a negative thing. In other words, they will do what Adam did, choose their own way, decide what is right and wrong, and in that, in, from that perspective, nothing will be impossible to them. Every evil of the imagination that they can come up with, they will do. That's what he's really talking about. So God scattered them to prevent this. But notice what he says here. He says, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. I mean, some families went here, some went there, and in different languages, you know, with their different languages and so on, and different cultures emerged. And, and what purpose does this accomplish other than just stopping them from doing what they were doing at the Tower of Babel? That they should seek God. Can they seek God or not? According to Paul, that was God's intent. So that by scattering them, then they would seek God rather than their own program or whatever they had in mind. In the hope, in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. So according to, uh, according to the Reformed tradition, nobody seeks God. Nobody can find him. He has to find them. But according to Paul here, uh, people do seek God, and sometimes they find him. Sometimes they find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. And then he quotes the, uh, some of the poets that they would have been familiar with in order to try to make his point. We won't go into that. But... Uh, Back to, back to the book of Romans, back to the, the, what we're quoting here from the Psalm 14. Paul is quoting from Psalm 14. <clears throat> Again, he says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become, now notice, they have turned aside. They were in one station and they turned to something else. They have become worthless. They were not worthless at one time, but now they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And he goes on to couple, quote from a couple of other psalms, both of which are according to this, you know, go, they this, the, port, this uh, same, the same thought here. But let's go back, to, we won't go to those, but we will go back to Psalm 14 and put it in its context. And the, some would say, well, the Apostle Paul is, uh, he's giving this, the, uh, the official, authoritative, and spirit-inspired interpretation. Well, yeah, he is, and what he says here does not at all contradict with what the spirit-inspired uh, psalmist wrote to begin with. Well, let's look at this and see that he's not speaking universally of every single human being, including every individual little baby. It's not what he's talking about. Look at uh, Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1. It says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, this is not talking about the likes of Richard Dawkins, even though one might conclude that he's a fool because he's an atheist. Nevertheless, nevertheless, what he has in mind here are those people who know better. They do know that there is a God, and yet they say in their hearts, and this, ex this exhibits itself by their behavior, there's no God. You see people like that all the time. You see people today. I've had friends. I've asked them, do you believe in God? Well, yeah. Yeah, of course I do. And yet they're behaving like they had no thought about, ever had any thought of God. And you, we all know people like that, don't we? And so what he's saying here, he says, the fool says in his heart. He, he, might, he might say that God exists. He might actually believe in God. But he says in his heart, 
And this, again, this is, exhibits itself by the behavior. There is no God. He lives as if there were no God. That's the point. And anybody that does that, the psalmist here says, they're a fool. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Now, wait a minute. Is this a universal statement or does he have a particular group in mind? You cannot apply this universally. I'll show you why in just a moment. Or one of many reasons. He goes on to say, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there is anyone who understand, to, who understand, who seek after God. And this is what he's quoting. Paul is quoting, I, I suppose, the Septuagint version. But so says, They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. This is the psalm, again, this is the psalm he's quoting. But notice, they have all turned aside. They've changed something. They have become corrupt. They weren't corrupt. There is none, I mean none of these, none of this group. There is none who does good, not even one. One of them. Okay? And then he says, have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. So the generation of the righteous is contrasted with this group he's talking about here. So you cannot take this Psalm 14 and say that that applies to every single human being on the face of the earth, including every little baby uh, wrapped up in its blanket. You can't do it. This is contrasting two different groups. And Paul is simply, in Romans chapter 3, is simply using, using this text to illustrate his point that all, whether Jew or Gentile, all are accountable before God. And you see sin is universal. Sin among the Gentiles, sin among the Jews, etc. And that's his point here. Okay, we could go on with these other psalms that he, he quotes. I'm not going to do that for sake of time. But uh, just uh, to sum up, indeed there have been times in millennia past when God has winked at or more or less overlooked. That's what he says to the people, the men on Areopagus. In times past, God has overlooked or winked at some of these things. Paul was looking around the city and seeing all the idolatry that had gone on, all the idols and the inscriptions to different gods and so on. He was appalled by it all. But he said there was, a, in the times past, God winked at this. What does that mean? Well, it, there was such a level of ignorance at one point that God more or less, he winked at it. That is to say, he overlooked it, turned a blind eye to some extent to the sins of human populations, especially, especially when it, they were in deep into ignorance due to widespread deception. But now, he says, Paul says, God is calling on people everywhere to repent and turn from their sins. And how is he doing that? Well, he's doing that through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, through the ministry of the Apostles, through the preaching of the Gospel. That's how he's doing it. In other words, the light of truth is coming to the nations now, Jews and Gentiles alike, through the preaching of the gospel. And it is through that means that God is now calling on people everywhere to repent and to turn from their sins. He's no longer winking at these things, but is now addressing them directly through the good news message. So through the spread of the saving truth contained in His Word is the answer to that. We who have received the Word are held accountable for what we know. That is why we simply cannot allow the evil influences, we must not allow the evil influences that are all around us to draw us away from the solid, objective, moral standards and truths set forth in the Word of God. For we live in a, t in a day when perversity is celebrated and when those who openly and proudly declare their sin as Sodom did theirs and are praised by public officials for their bravery and presented to the public as heroic, 
And all the while, and this is a fact, some people deny it, but actually there is a move toward, you see it in various places in media, different media, there is a move toward, even, even though we have more access to the Bible than ever before, nevertheless, nevertheless, there is an effort toward putting what, was, what is called fundamentalist Christianity, that is people, people who actually take this word seriously and believe in its laws and commandments, believe in the precepts set forth here and the truth that's set forth there, but Christian fundamentalists are more and more put in a very negative light, especially those who don't go along with the world's agenda. And so that's the world we're in, and the admonition to you, the exhortation, the encouragement to you and to all of us is to not allow these influences to begin to affect us negatively, not cave into them, and we must realize that just as in ancient times, sometimes, sometimes these things, the influences take, begin to take effect and we're not even aware of it. Because we, we deal with it day after day after day, we see it, we become accustomed to it, we realize it's there and we say, oh, this becomes a ho-hum thing. And then after a while, some of us start caving in a little bit and, and accepting it as normal, natural, and just the way things are when in fact God holds us to a high standard, high standard set forth in His law, set forth in the teachings of Jesus, set forth in this Word, the Holy Scriptures. So the admonition is for all of us is to hold fast to this Word and don't let anything in this world deter us, get in our way, serve as a stumbling block that could prevent us from entering the Kingdom of God.